Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome to Outside Sales Talk. Today, we've got John Barrows on the, on the call here, and uh, we're going to talk about top questions that you should ask every prospect. So John is the owner of Jay Barrows, and he's a world-class sales trainer, um, really well-known guy for this. He provides customized sales training and consulting services to, to boost revenue for leading companies such as Salesforce, Box, HP, LinkedIn. Uh, crazy resume on John here. Uh, he's driving results with proven techniques and reinforcement tools that impact adoption and behavior change. He's a well-published author. Um, he's been in Forbes, HP, HBR, Harvard, Harvard Business Review, Fortune, HuffPost, et cetera, et cetera. John, welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Um, so today, uh, we're, we're going to just kind of do some questions here and, and talk about, you, you know, kind of the areas that you, that you, uh, that you see as relevant in, in the trainings that you give to sales teams all around the world. Mm -hmm. from the perspective of, of outside and, and field sales reps. Yeah. So first of all, what are the top questions that outside sales reps should ask their prospects regardless of their industry? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of them obviously, but you know, we only have a certain amount of time. I always like to have contextual questions. So, you know, there's very few just go to generic questions. To me, a lot of it's all about the information you find out before you go meet with that client, which are the best questions. So like, here's an example. Uh, one of the things I always think you need to focus on as a sales rep early on in the qualification phase are what are the priorities of the business? So from a business standpoint, as an example, like when, you know, when your CEO stood up in the beginning of the year and said, these are the three things that we got to accomplish this year. What are, what are those three things? Right? Because if I can't tie my solution to one or two of those, the likelihood of me selling anything of significance is not high. You know, I, I might be able to get a license or two or whatever, but to really sell a big picture thing, if I can't impact that, forget about it. Yeah. Um, but the problem is, is that most sales reps, and I'll, and I'll say this about myself, up until I was about, I don't know, up until I'm 42 now, up until I was about 35 years old, I've always been a priority-based seller, but the way I used to get there was by saying stuff like, tell me about your priorities. You know, and having that very generic statement or asking that very generic question, I used to get very generic answers like, oh, revenue. It's like, oh, let me show you how it could impact your revenue, right? <laughs> you know, but, and, and, and so you're not really getting that, um, that real insight that you need to say, oh, okay, here's our stuff. So now what I do is hopefully I can go on their website. Hopefully I can look at some of their, you know, information, maybe some press releases or something like that. Or, you know, if they're a big enough account, they're, they're in report, those type of things. And ask, you know, hey, I was reading through and it said your top priorities were to do this. Help me understand how, you know, that, you know, how you're tracking towards those or what are some of the challenges that you're facing with addressing those or whatever. But if I can't find something specific about you, then at least I want to go after your persona, for instance, right? So for instance, CIOs in the healthcare industry have different priorities than CIOs in the manufacturing industry. If I understand what those priorities are, then I can ask questions that at least show that I know I kind of know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. you know, and it's because it's all about speaking the language of the people that you're talking to. I always say you get pushed to who you talk like, right? If you talk features, functions, speeds, and feeds, you're going to get pushed way below the power line to non-decision makers. If you talk vision, direction, and strategy, you're going to get people, you know, you're going to be able to at least hold your own up there at that level. Now, again, I don't want to pretend like I know what a CIO does on a day-to-day -day basis. I didn't go to school to be a CIO, right. but I can easily use Google and type in CIOs, priorities, 2018, healthcare. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Somebody's writing about it. And so then I can walk in and say, hey, we're typically dealing with CIOs in the healthcare industry, and they're telling us that their top priorities are X, Y, and Z. Are those yours by any chance? Even if they're not, the fact that you show you know their world a little bit tends to open up the conversation a little bit more. So, you know, that would be probably my, my number one uh, focal point when reaching out to prospects, when qualifying them, when talking to them is that those priority based, like what are they doing? And then the secondary piece on priorities is, it's a little bit further down the qualification process here, but it's, if, if there is something of need, Right. If they are looking for something or your solution does solve a problem that they're looking for, 
and they're interested in it, what are the criteria that they're using to make this decision prioritized? Mm-hmm. So, hey, look, when you're looking at, I ask people this all the time, you know, it's towards the end of the qual call where they're like, yeah, John, you know what, this looks good. Why don't you send me, you know, follow up, all this other stuff, right? And I'll ask them, okay, fantastic. First of all, who else are you talking to, right? Like what other competitors are you talking to? And that's it's probably another question that I would add in there. And it's funny how sometimes clients, they'll, they'll, they'll be hesitant to tell you, right? Well, well, we're not going to tell you who else we're talking to. It's like, give me a break, right? Um, <laughs> like, I'm not going to change my business model because you told me you're talking to. So what I do with this is the, the importance of knowing the exact competitors is, is so that you know you're at least play, you're playing in the right field, if you will. Right? You're comparing somewhat apples to apples because I used to sell outsourced IT services and we, this was, you know, 15, 20 years ago and we did outsourced IT services, you know, when you're a 50 person company with best practices and standards and we, instead of just giving you an hourly rate and saying, Hey, cool, call us, we'll come running. We would charge, you know, two, three, four, five thousand $5,000 a month to maintain your systems proactively, right? With monitoring tools, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But then there was solo, con- so, but our competitors were solo consultants who were charging 50 bucks, you know, an hour to come run in whatever you wanted. And then there was like a group of another tier was like another like group of three or four small engineer group, you know, that, that formed a company, had a little bit more resources, maybe charged a little bit more, maybe a hundred bucks an hour. But then there was companies like, like ours where we charged 150 to $250 an hour, but it was ma- maintenance, right? And we, we had 50 engineers and all this other stuff. Right. But I would ask a customer, well, who else are you talking to? Well, we're not comfortable with telling you that. It's like, look, the reason I'm asking isn't because I care necessarily who my exact competition is and I'm going to change my pitch here. The reason I care is because if you're talking to, and I would actually name my direct competitors, if you're talking to all bases covered and this company and this company, this company, then cool. Then I, I feel comfortable that we're in the same range here. But if you're talking to some solo consultant, some mid-level IT shop and us, my next question to you is going to be, is pricing the number one priority when making this decision? Because because I guarantee you, you're going to hear 50 bucks an hour from them and I'm going to tell you $150 an hour. And right there, you're going to be like, whoa, you guys are way too expensive, right? Yeah. So that's why I'm asking you that question, Mm -hmm. which by the way, is another tip here, which is every time you ask a question, pretend like the person is going to push back at you, push back on you immediately and say, why do you need to know that question? Right? Like, why do you need to know that? And you better have a damn good answer for that. And you can actually use that to preempt a lot of stuff. So I, I, I do a lot of, I'm not a big like sales book reading guy. I don't like reading a lot of sales books. I think most of them are fluff and crap. I like blogs, you know, but mm-hmm. um, I like more psychology on sales. And there's a book out there called uh, Influence by Robert Cialdini. Yeah, that's one of my favorite books of all times. So that was required reading for me when I was in business school, actually. Love it. And I, I think it should be, right? And remember this, remember the part where they talked about the, uh, of, of the power of giving somebody a reason, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Like, be, be the power of the word because. because I remember that. Right? I, and, I use that all the time, actually. I didn't, I didn't realize, I, I forgot that's where that came from. But yep. I, I'm, I, I'm always telling my salespeople and stuff like, you use the word because. It's a very powerful word. word. And I, I, didn't, I didn't even realize that's where I got it. <laughs> that's where it comes from, right? Because there's that study where they have all these people, you know, waiting in line to make copies at a copy machine in an office and the guy cuts in line. And the first part of the study, he doesn't give a reason. He says, hey, can I cut in line? And I think it's like 43% of the people are like, okay, whatever. But the other 57% were like, piss off. Yeah. Then they did the other study and the other part of the study and he cuts in line, but he gave a reason. And yeah. it didn't matter what the reason was, right? Hey, do you mind if I can make some copies? Because I need to make some copies, right? I mean, right. Just as long as he said, because I need to make some copies, like 93% of the people let him in. Right, right. So, yeah, yeah. so well, and especially if it's a if it's a reason that sounds powerful, like because I have a presentation with one of our customers coming up right now, you know, like like absolutely, it, it, it's I mean, almost didn't matter, right? If you have a yeah. reason that's even kind of reasonable, everyone's like, oh yeah, 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 fine. Okay, like so that's why if you think about clients, right? A lot of times clients are hesitant to to answer a question from a sales rep because in the back of their head they're like why are you asking me that question like and what are you tricky sales rep going to do with my answer here right 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 right. so a lot of times i'll just straight up tell them why i'm asking that question before they even ask Mm -hmm. so for instance going back to that hey when your ceo stood up in the beginning of the year and said these are the top three priorities what what were those three priorities the reason I ask is because if, if I can't tie my solution to one or two of those, then it's probably not even worth us having this conversation. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's, oh. a, that's a very powerful way of laying that out. I, I, I love it. Yeah. So, so have that reason. Um, you know, and there, there's a bunch of other questions, you know, I think priorities and timeline are probably the two most important things that I hunt for. Um, when, when qualifying, I don't really care about budget cause I can find, I can, I can find budget if the need is really there. Yeah. Um, I don't really, you know, authority that's important. You know, I'm going through the bant, right? Budget authority mm -hmm. sure. and stuff, whatever, I, you know, most of that's kind of crap. I, I the, the, but the need is, is really where I want to focus my efforts on because if I can figure out, you might not even know you have that need, but by me asking some questions about your priorities, what, you know, what your current solution is and those type of things, and then being like, Ooh, you know, they have some challenges here that my solution can address that they might not even know if there's really that need there and that fit there, look, I can find budget. I can get to authority. I could expedite a timeline even if I needed to. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but you know, timeline for me is important just to understand how much effort do I need to be putting into this in the short term, midterm, long term here. Yeah, so, yeah. cause once you have priorities and timeline, then you can do challenger sale, right? So you've read, have you read challenger sale yet? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, like you, I don't read a lot of sales books, but I, uh, I do, I do try to read the summaries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got the cliff notes version of it, right? Whatever. Exactly. So, uh, but the challenger sales, the two sides of it, right? One's lead with insights and, and, you know, and say, Hey, here, Hey, here's a, a article or here's a whatever. And here's how our solution can address that for the open market, whatever. But the other side is literally challenging the client to think differently, like pushing back on them and effectively the way, it, you know, you don't say this, but you're like, look, you make this decision maybe once a year. I make, I help people make this decision every day. You know, here's how people do it right. And here's how people do it wrong. And I'm, so I'm going to challenge you based, if I think you're doing it wrong, I'm going to challenge you. Right. Yeah. You really can't do that unless you have their priorities and their timeline. Mm -hmm. Because if the, the biggest problem with closing, for instance, and I train on closing techniques and stuff like that, the biggest problem with closing is uh, we're always closing on our timeline, not theirs. Right. So we got to close the end of the month. We got to close the end of the quarter. We got to close, you know, that type of stuff. Right. Um, and if that's the case, you pretty much have to use discounts to close your deals. Um, yeah, yeah. But if you're closing on their timeline, because if they need it by a certain time or whatever, like then you can push, then you can be not aggressive, but a lot more direct with your approach mm -hmm. because you're holding them accountable for what they already told you. Yeah. I, I try to train my reps to get, get our, get our customers to do like an ROI analysis of, of what it would mean to use our solution. And, mm -hmm. and then I, I using their numbers and we've got a spreadsheet that we do this with using their numbers, will show them, okay, so you're losing this much every month that you don't do this. And once mm -hmm. you get them to agree to that, you're like, well, okay, so how many months do you want to lose 10 grand a month? Cause that's, that's where these are your numbers. We all agreed that this is, this is what's happening. So, you know, they it basically put, you're, you're putting it in their, in their, in their ball, in their ballpark. You're like this thing costs 10 grand a year and you're losing 10 grand a month. How many, how many months till you can do this? Like, Exactly. Well, and that's why, you know, kind of leads to another question I recommend people ask. And this is, <clears throat> this is a scary one for reps to ask and they almost never do, but I think they all should which is, Hey, what happens if you don't make this decision? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? The answer is nothing. <laughs> well, there, there's usually, there's, there's two answers, right? There's like, well, if we, there's a definite answer, like, yes, if we, if we don't do this, we're screwed basically. Like we have to, yeah. you know, we're going to miss these marks or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's not whether you make the decision with me. I'm just saying in general, because everybody's number one competitor is no, is, is no decision. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so the question is, is out of all the other competitors, you were, whoever you're going to decide to go with, what happens if you just straight up don't make this decision? Yeah. And the answer is, eh, well, you know, we just kind of keep going back to doing what we're doing. Two things there, either a, you're not talking to the right person or actually probably three things. One is you're not talking to the right person. Two is you haven't really uncovered the true impact that you can have for that based on, you know, you know, based on the alignment there. Mm -hmm. And or, or three is they just, they don't need it uh, or it's not a priority. So I, you know, you could keep working with them on it. I just wouldn't forecast that. You know right. what I mean? Like when somebody, when I ask you, Hey, what time, what happens if you don't make this decision? And you're like, eh, like, I'm not like, all right, peace, hang up. But I'm just like, all right, forecast goes from 80 percent or to a 20 percent or right. uh, we'll see right. what happens on this one. Yeah, that, 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 uh, that is definitely accurate. That's a key thing. Yeah. What, what do you do if the prospect doesn't give you the concrete answers that you're expecting? 
Um, so this is where layering questions come into play. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's open-ended, closed-ended questions. And I, you know, that's a lot of sales 101 stuff, but it still blows my mind how many sales rep ask closed-ended questions during, you know, uh, during the discovery phase. Like I'll sit on a lot of call calls with reps and they'll be asking yes, no questions all day. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and I found there's only one population on the planet that, that answers closed-ended questions with open-ended answers and it's sales reps. We are literally the only ones when asked a yes or a no question, we'll say yes, but, and then go on for the next 10 minutes about something. Most other people will say yes or no. So right. it's important to know that. But the really where I focus a lot of my effort on is, is I call them layering questions where it's, you know, could you explain to me how, could you give me an example of, could you clarify for me those type of things? Mm -hmm. Because when they're not giving you that concrete answer, it's either A, because they're uncomfortable and that's why I jump in with the reason I'm asking. So then a lot of times that'll open up the door. Mm -hmm. But then I just, could you help me understand what you mean by that? Like, you know, for, you know, or, and that's also a good uh, objection handling technique, by the way, it's called the clarification technique, which is when somebody says, for instance, we don't have any budget for this. Well, what do you mean you don't have any budget for this? Do you mean you literally have no money as a business? Or this isn't a budgeted thing or you're spending money in other areas you actually think is more important than this. Which one is it, right? Right, right. Three different objections right there. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think if you're not getting concrete answers, it's because, first of all, you probably have, they're pretty generic questions. I'd push back to ask what kind of questions you're asking to not get concrete answers. Uh, you don't have real good reasons for why you're asking, or at least the client doesn't feel like you do. Um, or you're not digging deep enough to, to really understand the true essence of what they're telling you. Yeah. I, I've read some of your stuff on on layering, and uh, the 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 question that I've asked for years as when when I my whole career is in sales, and the the question when I read your stuff, I was like, oh, I do this, and the, and the thing that I use is I I say, I'm confused. How does it show me how? Or I'm confused. Could you explain to me? Like I'm confused. I I the, the I feel like the, I don't know why this is, but. It, I'm confused is a very powerful phrase, mm -hmm. kind of like the word because, you know, it's yeah. like, it's, it, if you, if you start out with that, it's very, I think it's disarming, it's vulnerable and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can pretty much ask anything if you start off with, I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, and, and you could, or like, Hey, help me understand. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, look, I'm not, and, and I'll, and I'll preface it with, look, I'm not trying to sell you anything you don't need here. Okay. I just want to make sure that you have the, in, the information that you need to make a good decision, whether it's the right one for your business or not. Like that's what I'm here to guide you through here, you know, hopefully, but you know, could you help me understand what you mean by that? Or, or what happens a lot of times with what I can do is when, or what I do is when somebody asks me a, when I ask them a question, they don't really give me an answer. They give me some rambling answer that's, that's you know, it's kind of the answer, but it's not. Yeah. That's where, quote unquote, active listening comes into play. And you can summarize that back to them. Mm -hmm. So just let me make sure I'm clear with what you said here. What you said was boom, boom, and boom, right? Is, is that it? Because a, a lot of times when you rephrase it back to them in a way that maybe is not exactly what they said, but paraphrases to a certain degree, mm -hmm. then they'll be like, well, no, I, well, yes, but, and then they'll clarify a little bit more for you. Mm -hmm. And then you start to get the real information, right? Because, because again, it shows you you care, you're, you're actively listening, like you're genuinely trying to understand what they say there. Mm -hmm. And yet, and you, they don't want you to think like if you phrase it in a certain way based on what they said and it's not really, they know it's not really that they're automatic. You know, a lot of times they almost feel like they have to, well, no, but like here and that's mm -hmm. when the conversation starts to get going. Well, it, and something I, I should, I should point out here for people that are listening to this on a podcast, as opposed to the people that are, that are watching it on YouTube, you, the, uh, you did some body language things right there that I can see on the video, but they can't see you. You kind of shrugged your shoulders a little and then turned your hands out like this yeah. and, showing, and showed your wrists in a very like, I'm confused when you're like, I, I help me understand. I'm confused. And you, you kind of shrugged your shoulder, pulled your wrist back and showed, showed your wrist. It's very vulnerable. Like, you know, it's a, it, you had, you had the exactly the right body language that shows like, I'm not coming at you on this one. Hey, I'm just, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, uh, that, that's a, that, that, it's a, you it jumped out at me as other, oh, he's, he's doing the exact thing that you would want to do. Like, it's very, yeah. very, uh, I don't know what the word for it is. Non-threatening. It's not, mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think you like, that's why you, 
I'm all about preparing questions. Like I, th- I think you should prepare questions specific to the account based on your research, mm-hmm. but you can't and you shouldn't just go through your route questions, right? Because you know, it, 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 once it starts to feel like an interrogation and not a conversation, that's when clients shut down. That's when they give you those yes, no answers. That's when they're not concrete with giving you insights because they feel like they're an interrogation. Yeah. You know, I call it the doctor checkup questions. Well, what do you do for this? You know, because as sales reps, look, we're taught to dig for pain, right? Mm-hmm. Which historically we've all been on dig for pain, right? Which is fine. But when you just dig for pain, right? Well, what do you do for this? And what do you do for that? What do you, I call them doctor checkup questions, right? And you, you, right. you kind of dig, 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 dig. And then what's funny is, is like, if we find pain, we get all excited about it. And we cram our finger and wiggle it around a little bit and tell them we can fix it. Yeah. So, if you really think about how, like when we dive right into pretty much the solution, like, Hey, what are you doing for this? Right? Because that's what I sell. Then we pepper them with questions and find painting. You know, we wonder why they're not opening up. Right. That's why what I try to do, regardless of, you know, any specific question, I try to level up a little bit, start with kind of some higher level stuff about the industry, about their business, about where things are going, about maybe some competition in their industry that I know about to get them speaking uh, about what's about stuff that they're the experts in, right? Where, you know, cause you can, you can almost see in this is body language stuff. Every single meeting, whether it's in person or over the phone starts with somebody sitting back in their chair, arms folded like this, like right. client, right? And, mm-hmm. and my, my job as a sales rep is I want in the first five minutes of the conversation, I want you to go from this position, sitting back in your chair to leaning up in your chair and leaning forward to say, oh shit, right? Because if yeah. you've ever been in a meeting where somebody said, wow, you've done your homework, right? Like mm-hmm. that immediately changes the, the the dynamic of that meeting. Yeah. Right? You can literally hear, like, you can almost hear in the in the prospect's head, like, oh shit, this guy's, that, this is actually a legit sales rep who came prepared. Uh, I, I, gotta, I gotta step up my game now, as opposed to the typical sales rep that just goes through their route questions and then fires off their PowerPoint and drones through 30 slides. Yeah, it's so important to read the body language of the room. I, I remember this one sales call I was on years ago. Uh, it, was, it was when people st- still had Blackberries. I'm dating myself a little bit. But the, 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 the decision maker in the room was kind of like, there were, there were probably six or seven people in the room. And the decision maker was like not even at the table. They were like back from the table, like kind of almost in the corner, leaning back in their chair, like like drilling away in their Blackberry, typing out emails or something. And, yep. uh, and then then his team was kind of around the table uh, and, and I was talking to the team and doing my, my whole, my whole pitch. And I watched him throughout the meeting, throughout the meeting kind of scoot forward about six, six feet, eight feet and end up at the table, like, you know, like leaning forward interested where he started yeah. like, you know, totally just like out of it, but over mm-hmm. like he scooted and scooted slowly, but surely and came to the table. It was, it was yeah. a very visual thing to, uh, to watch what was going on as he, as he was kind of getting interested and, and getting excited about it. Yeah. I mean, nope. but, but that's why face-to-face meetings are the best if you can get them, right? I mean, because you can read that body language. I mean, I think there's a study out there. I forget it's Dr. Albert so-and-so that talks about how um, the way that we communicate, right? 8, 35, 57, 8% is the words that we use, 35% is the tonality, and 57% is body language. Yeah. So face-to-face selling a lot better or doing stuff like this where I can see your body language and how, you know, that type of thing. That's why I like Zoom. I do a lot of my stuff. I used to do Road Warrior. I used to be on the, you know, driving around all around Massachusetts here going on four, five, six sales calls a day. Mm -hmm. Now I do almost all my stuff remotely. But what I try to do is, is I I use Zoom. So, you know, I light up Zoom for almost every call so the person can see me mm-hmm. and there's some sincerity to it and they can understand that I'm not just some, you know, sales rep who's just droning through a list of people. Yeah. I right, actually care. So that body language is critical if you can, if you can read it. Yeah. I, 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 I'm a big believer in, in the power of getting in front of someone and shaking their hand and being eye to eye. I think Zoom is a, is a, is a good second choice. Um, and, yeah. and they're, and both are so much zoom and the other things like it. Um, the, and, and then, uh, then a, a, a distant third is, is over the phone. I, I, I mm-hmm. feel like a lot of companies that have big inside sales teams would shorten their sales cycles and get a lot more deals done and have better relationships and higher customer satisfaction if they would get face to face with their customers. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it obviously it depends on what your average contract value is and all that other yeah. stuff. I mean, if you're selling something that's a couple grand, like, no, nah, it doesn't make any sense. But yeah, if you're selling yeah. mid-market or enterprise, ACV in the 50 Gs range, yeah. You know, and, and lifetime value of a client three, four, five years into it, you know, 100K plus, then yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, there's if actually, if someone's uh, going to be giving you six figures, you, you gotta, you gotta have bought them some steak, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Figuratively or literally either way. Yeah. Um, well the next step, next section here uh, is, is what I call sales in 60 seconds. So sure. I'm going to drill you with a handful of questions. Just give me a short answer that with, you know, the goal being that it's under 60 seconds. Cool. So if, uh, if you only had three minutes with a prospect, what would you say? Messages you get across. Um, I would come up with two or three go-to questions based on the persona that I was going after, and then I would articulate the value of my solution as it related to those. So, for instance, when I cold call to somebody, a lot of times people pick up the phone. Look, I'm super busy right now. I'm in a meeting or whatever it is. What I'll say is, look, I got two questions. I need two minutes of your time. At the end of that, you can tell me to go away if you want. Uh, all right, fine. What? Okay, my questions are: one is, what are your growth projections this year? My second one is, you're 100 percent confident as a VP of sales that all of your initiatives right now are going to help you align with those and achieve that goal. The reason I ask those is because, and by the way, I don't give a shit what your growth projections are. All I care about is that secondary one is, are you 100% confident that every single one of your initiatives right now is going to help you achieve those goals? Because if you are, let's get off the phone right now. Mm -hmm. If not, can I get 10 minutes of your time to talk to you about how I'm working with some other companies to help them achieve their goals with our sales training? Mm -hmm. so I, think you, I think you need to come up with some punch them in the mouth type questions that gets them to think or at least pause for a second and then share with them maybe an, an example of somebody that you're working with that's like them that's been able to drive results using your stuff. Yeah. Awesome. So what's a common mistake you see field sales reps make in their conversations with prospects? Uh, that their product matters. Their product, like reps think that their product, their slide deck, their demo is what matters, and it doesn't. The only thing that matters is what the client's doing, what their priorities are, and what their needs are. And if your solution can align with those, fantastic. But too many sales reps make the assumption that, oh, just because they kind of fit the mold of somebody that's used our services in the past, let me just get in front of them and show them our demo and drone through my slide deck like they care. Mm -hmm. People don't give a shit about the whole slide deck. They don't care about the entire pitch. They only care about what's going on in their world, what they, what their priorities are, what their competition is doing, you know, those type of things. So the common mistake I would say is that people care about us. <laughs> they don't. I, I'm not going to lie, John, I'm going to have to watch this again, but take notes on it so I can apply some of the things that you're saying to my sales team. Like I keep, I keep thinking to myself, uh, man, I got to write this down. <laughs> <laughs> well, so good. It's so good. You're good, man. You're good. Um, so, uh, what's what? In your opinion, what is the most important part of the sales process, and why? Discovery, discovery, discovery. Period. Uh, well, uh, well, actually, all right. Uh, yes, discovery. Once you get the call, I actually think the most important part of the sales process is prospecting. Prospecting, prospecting. Pro I don't care how experienced you get. I don't care what your role is in sales. Prospecting because. Yeah, I found one solution to every other problem at every other stage of the sales process. Negotiating, discounting, you know, all that stuff becomes a lot easier with a big fat pipeline. Yeah. You got a big fat pipeline, the rest of that stuff doesn't matter. Like I don't discount anymore at all. Like straight up, I zero discounting right. because I don't need to. Because right now, like I'm booked through August, right, for my right. on training. So if you want training, it's in September and it's rate card. You know right. why? Because my, my best accounts, my biggest accounts are paying rate card. And so when you come to me, I can say, look, you know, I, cause I want to put myself in a position where I want your business. I don't need your business. Mm -hmm. Cause if I, if I want your business, I sell the right way. I ask the right questions. I, I say the right things. I, I close on your timeline, not mine. Mm -hmm. If I need the business, I do some shady shit. You know what right. I mean? Like yeah. I call you up at the end of the month, I give you that discount you didn't even ask for. I go over your head because I'm not at power, right? And I got to, uh, I'm not, I need a decision maker and I ruin the relationship. Right. Those are unnatural things that I do because I have to hit my target. But if I, if my pipeline's nice and full, I could care less when you close. I, I'm just trying to sell you the right way. Mm -hmm. And if you want the extra 5% off the top just to get this deal done, like, like if you want to bicker over that, then I probably just didn't do enough, good enough job articulating the value of my solution. Yeah. So, 
I'm going to rephrase prospecting is the number one, but then after that it's qualification, qualification, qualification. Cause once you really hone in on the true needs, then the closing, I don't want to say takes care of itself, but it tends to be a lot easier. Yeah. Um, that, the, the prospecting piece is what was what I always attributed my success when I was a salesperson. 100%. I, I always, I remember at one point there, I was on a team of like, like 10 people when I was at Google and, uh, and, my my uh, our our manager at one point I was in a meeting with him and he's like, do you know that you you have seventy three percent of the whole team's deals right now? Like mm -hmm. in terms of like the number of the the and most of them were in the early stages, but it's like your 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 numbers are just way off from everyone else's. Like you have all it was opportunities like what we had qual we called qualified opportunities, and that was the whole reason I was successful. It wasn't because I was a better negotiator or because I was Ooh. smarter or because I was harder working. I mean, it was because I was doing a lot of prospecting, and there were there was a you know there I just had more opportunities, so they were more of them were closing because I was I was focusing on doing find, uncovering the deals and prospecting every day, and so they were they were eventually six months later they would roll, they would flow through the pipeline, right? Absolutely. What is the number one key that you think sales reps should should ha use to differentiate themselves from competitors? Uh, I would say, well, what they should use or what they have. I, I think that, it, and, I, and I guess they're both, right? I think the number one competitive differentiator any of us have are uh, for our product or service outside of ourselves and our, you know, our, our hard work and you know our empathy and those type of things, which are really hard to teach. You know what I mean? It's hard, hard to teach empathy. It's hard to teach passion. It's hard to teach hard work. Those type of things. But what what we can all use, I think, um, the number one competitive differentiator any of us have are the results we drive for our customers. Mm -hmm. So from a messaging standpoint, right? I always say, look, what, what our marketing partner says about us, you know, we're the leading provider of whatever, nobody cares. Um, what, what Gartner says about us being in the fourth quadrant, yay, third party validation, giddy up, right? Whatever. Mm -hmm. But what our clients say about us is hands down the best stuff that we got, right? Because that's the number one thing that your competition can't say that they have. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, cause, cause look, if I'm a competitor of yours, I have the battle sheet, I have your strengths and weaknesses, you know what I mean? So when you're reaching out to people, you, you might say, oh, well, our people are different. You know, we, we got a great support set. It's like, what do you think your competition's out there being like, well, look, our technology is awesome, but man, our people suck. Like, woof, no, they are terrible, but man, our technology or like, you know, Hey, we give you a 360 degree view of your customer, blah, blah, blah. What do you think your competition's out there? But we only give you 180, but man, that 180 is fantastic. Right? <laughs> like we're saying the same stuff you are. Yeah. Everybody's literally saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, but what they have a really hard time lying about, are the results you drive for your customers. So, and yeah. by the way, that's the easiest way to come up with messaging. So instead of call calling people and whatever, hey, we're the leading provider of, and this is, you know, feature function, da, 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 the, re the way I make phone calls is, hey, the reason for my call today is, we just showed this company in your industry how to drive these type of results, and you fit a very similar profile to that, I'd love to have a conversation with you about it. Give me a call back, 617-529, right? Yeah. That, and those stories, that's why case studies, if there's any investment that I would make in marketing, if I was a, a, you know, somebody out there listening, it would be case studies, case studies, case studies, and not just case studies, but quantifiable results from case studies. Mm -hmm. You can literally say, we took a client from here to here. Now, I don't know whether we can do that for you, but man, we did it for somebody else. Yeah, and they're an awful lot like you. I mean, I, yeah, I feel like so much marketing messaging that people are getting is, we will help you sell more. We will help you save costs. Uh, we were, we will, you know, make you more profitable and they're all kind of saying the same thing. It, it's, it's way more powerful. Uh, it's funny. She says we, we actually have a, an initiative on our marketing team right now to do more case studies because we've got our, you know, 10 or whatever nice case studies we've just kind of been pointing to for, for years, yep. but we, I, I would like, you know, 30 or 50 of them that we could be, that we can, that way we can be like, Oh, here's one in your exact industry. Exactly. Here is one that, you, you know who the people, you know these people that, that uh, you know of this company, they're, they're a competitor or they're adjacent to you or whatever. You should actually um, take a look at a product called Success Kit um, because what they're doing is they're taking testimonials and case studies and, and putting and then serving them up at the right stages of the sales process based on who you're talking to. So it actually gives co context around those case studies to the people that you're talking to. Oh. There's cool tools out there that are doing stuff like that for marketing teams. So Very cool. even, look, you don't have to have the full case study. All, all I actually look for is the result piece of it. 
You know what I mean? And that mm -hmm. result piece of it then leads to, then I, you know, so if you don't have a lot of market for a lot of companies out there that don't have a lot of marketing resources, just get that snippet and then ask that client if they'd be a reference for you so that the, your prospect can then call them to talk about the details of how that happened. Mm -hmm. But it, at the very li limited, hey, John, we were able to increase our conversion research from five to 15% after your training. Like, holy crap, that's okay, thank you. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's and awesome. the difference, by the way, but the there's a big difference between sales messaging and marketing messaging. And the difference is this. Marketing messaging is stuff like, on average, our clients see a 32% increase or up to a 45% whatever, right? Mm -hmm. That's marketing messaging. Sales messaging is, no, 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 no. We showed this client in your industry how to do this thing, like this exact thing, right? Yeah. Or this, the exact, we, they got 38.2%. This company, not on average, but that company saw this exact result. That's yeah. sales ready messaging versus marketing messaging. So true. Um, what is the one thing that you preach in every one of your sales trainings? What's the key message? <laughs> uh, science, um, science versus art. Uh, I, I think too many people look at, I mean, there's a lot of things I preach, work your ass off. There's no success. There's no, you know, there's no secret to success. It's just working your ass off. Yeah. I always say I'm not the smartest guy. I went to a state school, drank my way through four years of college, whatever it is, but, you know, but I'll work, I'll work, I'll outwork you hands down. There's no question. Right. So, so that's why, you know, people ask me, what's the secret to success. That's a secret to success. It's working harder than anybody else. Um, mm -hmm. But outside of that, you know, and for I, a longer period of time, I've, I've yeah. found that over overnight success only takes about 15 years. Oh yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, we were talking about Gary Vaynerchuk, um, uh, before this. And, and I really recommend you take a look at him because he says that all the time. He's like, a lot of people say, oh, you're overnight ex success. He's like, if you think I'm an overnight success, go back and look at what I was doing, you know, 20, 30 years ago. He's like, I've been working this hard. He's like, when I was 16 years old, while all my friends were out, you know, riding their bikes and trading cards and stuff like that, I was at my dad's wine shop. I was doing this. I was doing that in my twenties. I wasn't going out to the bars and drinking my ass off. And I was actually working every weekend nights, that type of stuff. And now the guy's a multimillionaire running a Six hundred million dollar Vayner Media step, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that's you know that that's the key. But you know, I, I think the probably more more realistic of uh, of things to talk about here, or you know, that's not so obvious, is is treating sales way more scientifically than artistically. Um, a lot of people think sales is an art form. Obviously, it is, but I think it's actually more of a science than an art because the science, the structure, allows for the art form to be that much more effective. So, for instance, you know. Somebody asked me, John, now that you're, you know, 42, if you could go back and tell your 22 year old self something, what would it be? Right. My number one answer to that was AB split test everything you do. Literally AB split test everything. And I mean this across the board. So for instance, I used to make 400 dials a, a week when I was selling outsourced IT services, right? And I would make 400 dials and it was an elevator pitch that I could, I could still recite to this day. Sure. Right. And, and, and I would just, and I would just make my ears bleed. Right. Cause it was, it was just a pure numbers game. Mm -hmm. Now, looking back on it, instead of making 400 blind cold calls with a generic elevator pitch, I'd come up with four different approaches and I'd make 100, 100, 100, 100, and I would see which one yielded a higher response rate. You know, if I have one email that I could send out to a group of 50 people, I'm not going to send the exact same email out to 50 people. I'm going to send 25 and 25. I'm going to change the subject line, right? See which one gets a higher open rate. Mm -hmm. um, dealing with gatekeepers. Be super nice to them in the morning. Be super direct to them in the afternoon. See which one yields a higher. Objection handling. We all get the same objections. Write down an objection. Google objection handling techniques. Find two different objection handling techniques. And then write down object, ob objection down. And then for an entire week when that objection comes up, deal with it this way. And then another week, deal with it that way. And see which mm -hmm. one yields a higher. So that way you can get a lot better, a lot faster, and you don't need some idiot trainer like me coming in and, and doing a train because then you could just read a blog or a tip or whatever and be like, ooh, there's a new idea, and then you can put it into that equation and compare it to what you know works, yeah. and you can iterate and iterate and iterate and evolve. So if you take sales way more scientifically than artistically, you're gonna be a much better sales rep and you're gonna be a much better sales leader and executive ultimately. Because the problem is a lot of times when sales reps, the best sales reps get promoted to be managers, it's not always the best idea because a lot of times be best of the best, right? And by the way, I'm talking two to 5% of our population are like the natural born sales professionals, the ones who just know exactly what questions to ask, where to focus their time, you know, and they're just, 
innately abil- th- their abilities are just you can't replicate, right? Yeah. Those are the worst managers because they have no idea how they're how they do what they do. Right. The best managers are the kind of B plus A minus reps who are consciously competent. They know exactly what's working and what's not, and they have a process and, and a way to adjust and, and track along the way because that, that can be replicated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? I always say, look, you know, art was my first major in college. Um, I realized real quick I wasn't going to make any money doing it, so I got out of it. But you know, <laughs> Picasso Picasso is my favorite artist, right? I, would, I will never be Picasso. There's no way I'd be Picasso. But if you give me a paint by numbers – and you tell me put red there, yellow there, orange there, green there, and then allow me to mix it up a little bit, mm-hmm. now all of a sudden I can come pretty close. And that's yeah. what we need to do. We need to all level up in sales because it is, yes, it's an individual thing, but it's a team sport where it should be if you really want to be successful. And so sharing best practices, leveling up, you know, split testing, trying different things out and figuring out what works and doesn't is a way for all of us to, to raise, the, raise the bar here in sales. Yeah, and I've always felt that, salespeople benefit from using some of these key tools that are in a marketer's toolbox, like, like Amy testing or split testing. I mean, the doing it to using those tools in your own, in your own territory with your own customers and, and using it to, to improve yourself and, and, and hone your craft is, mm-hmm. uh, is key. Well, John, I, I I'm going to summarize, um, the, 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 the the things we've talked about because a lot of people are on the road when they're listening to this. And so I like to kind of give them a, a refresher cause they don't, they don't get to take notes. And if you hear it twice, it tends to stick with you a little better. Right. So I'll try to summarize this, this, uh, this in about a minute here. So the best questions to ask are contextual questions, ask prospects mm-hmm. about their goals and priorities to see if your solution is a good fit and can help them reach those goals. Then you can map your solution to their vision and show how you can provide value. Also find out what criteria they use to determine their priorities to get an even deeper understanding. Asking about what other competitors they're talking to at the moment is another key question that can help you in the qualification phase. Another great tip from John is every time you ask a question, pretend like the person is going to push back on you and make sure you have a good answer for that concern they might bring up. Always give a reason on why you're asking that question, because it's a very powerful world, uh, a very powerful, powerful word. Use it more often. Ask questions about their timeline, so you know how much effort you need to put into it. And also challenge the client to think differently and question the way they're currently doing things. To get concrete answers from your prospect, ask open-ended and layering questions. Ask, what do you mean by that? Could you clarify this for me? Or say something like, help me understand this so that I can make sure we're heading in the right direction here. Active listening is another key technique we talked about here. Rephrase their answers back to them to, to have them clarify where they're coming from and provide more details. Make sure you don't sound like you're interrogating your prospects, this might intimidate them and lead them to not be open to you. Body language is critical, and if you can't read it, and if you can read it, it can be very powerful. If you can't read it, you're at a disadvantage, and that's a a problem with just doing things over the phone, uh, and a huge advantage field salespeople have getting Mm -hmm. face-to-face. if you have a call, try to do it with video. If if you don't, if you can't be face to face, and it's way way better than uh, than just over the phones. And you not only do you connect with them better, but you can read their body languages. the The two most important questions, if you have a limited time with prospects, are: What are your growth projections for the year? And are you a hundred percent confident with your current initiatives that you'll achieve those goals? If they say no, you'll give them a reason to listen to you further. Prospecting is crucial. To be successful in sales, having a big pipeline will make all the other steps in the sales process easier for you. Include concrete numbers in sales conversations to show, the, to show your prospect how you've helped other companies in their industries increase their revenue by X percent or help them improve X by Y percent. Finally, a great piece of advice is to try different approaches and split test when dealing with clients to constantly get better at your job and find out what works and what doesn't. And this will put you ahead in sales. 
So that's, that's my quick summary of the, the knowledge that John has uh, provided for us here. John, where can listeners read more about your work and how can they reach out to you? Cool. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, just the uh, best thing is to go to my website, right? jbarrows.com. So it's J, the letter J, B A R R O W S dot com. <laughs> um, that's, I put, I'd say, I put, you know, probably 80, 90% of what I train on, I put out there for free. So between my blog and my resource library, there's video tips, there's uh, blog posts, there's te- you know, templates, there's tons of resources there. Uh, and then, you know, on, on all the social channels, you know, I'm doing everything out there to kind of build my brand personally and get, get good content out there on all the different channels like Instagram, uh, Snapchat, even uh, Facebook, all those different ones. So uh, the handle on most of them is John M as in Michael Barrows. So you can hit me up on any one of those. Uh, and then we got a Facebook group. So if you go to Facebook slash Jay Barrows, uh, there's a lot of interaction there. There's actually a group called Make It Happen on that group uh, is where a lot of clients who I've trained are in there and reps asking each other questions and helping each other out. So there's a, there's a good forum there. And uh, yeah, and just again, just try to, try to do my best to share content out there that's going to help people drive some short-term results. And most everything that I talk about is very execution oriented in the sense that like, hey, go do this, right? And try it out and see what works, right? Because I'm just a big believer that as sales professionals, because of this is because this is one of the least educated professions, just at least formally, right? Like, you know, in universities and stuff, there's very few majors you can get in sales. Very few, very few, uh, very, very few universities have any courses in sales. There's a handful. Yeah. And I'll, and there's, I'll, uh, we're up to about 70. We're up to, there's 4,132 colleges in America. We're up to about 69 or 70. So okay. it's, it's well, getting there. Sounds like this is something you've looked into. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know it well. And I'll, and I'll tell you, it is something that can be taught in schools. I'm, I'm, shocked that they don't because they're you know I, I and I've hired I've hired young people out of these programs over the years and they do pick things up faster and better because they have the academic background in it um, mm-hmm. one of the guys on my team is, is that's done really well he I mean his his major had, was was basically sales I forget what they called it but it was you know they had him like learning about all these concepts and frameworks from when he was 18 years old it's fantastic I, I don't know why people don't do it more often well, I'll tell you, and then we, we, we can jump, but I'll tell you, it's because I think, again, historically, people looked at sales as a pure art form. You either had to have it or you didn't. Mm. When they start looking at it as a science, with behavioral science and those type of things and putting structure to it, now you can teach it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, Blows my mind. 30, 30% of jobs or something must be sales. And uh, I don't know the exact everybody. stat. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you know that stat too. But no, I, but everybody's in My opinion is everybody's in sales. Whether you like yeah. it or not, it's all about do you believe in what you do? And, and if you believe in what you do, I don't care if you're the, you know, the most technical engineer on the planet. Once that engineer, if you, here's proof that everybody's in sales. If you ever interview for a job and you get your job, you're in sales. Congratulations. Right. You have just made a sale. <laughs> exactly. If you ever an engineer, if you ever meet an engineer who says they're on sales, ask that engineer the next, like what was the last coolest thing that they built and watch them light up like a Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. And, and they're, what they're doing there is they're selling it because somebody told me this early in my career and will leave with this is that sales is the transfer of enthusiasm. And oh, I, I love it. I believe that I fundamentally believe that if you believe in your product and you, and you fit that and somebody else fits that profile, then my job is to transfer a little bit of my enthusiasm over to you and then back it up with some facts. I love it, John. Well, thanks so much for being on the show today. This has been fantastic. 